And we had a fairly robust bio that we had sent out and that you and Nick went through several times as well. So I think there's a lot of um, at least scribed written information students had in just getting tuned into the bio. I would say that the really unique things about your voice and your mind uh, is the amount of knowledge that you have that really comes from uh, an on the ground, inside evidentiary approach to knowledge. Um, and I've been really overwhelmed as I use the term Renaissance man. You have a, a extraordinary range of interests and capacities. You've been, uh, I think, close to the sources of power, including um, serving in a very important way uh, for uh, the Sultan and the council, and you've done prolific work on your own. And I've always been fascinated by the way you managed to, without exactly putting it this way, talk about um, looking for the uh, a capacity to run through a yellow light, but not a red light. That to be really effective in the policy uh, and the knowledge that you're trying to disseminate, you don't want to break um, a certain red line that you know will leave you out of the inner sanctum and your capacity to do some of the things you do inside the ballpark, so to speak. I've always been very interested in your, uh, in your ability to, to walk that uh, walk and to also stay in contact with people, I think, that, that have run that red line and hear what broadly is not necessarily conspiratorial things, but to hear what uh, critical things are happening in the country. So I think without further ado, you are a unique voice. Um, you're always number one in our trip. Um, and you're always the person we can't wait with bated breath to hear about the latest analysis because you are able to say things that sometimes sort of I go, oh, is he gonna be all right having said that? Um, and uh, I appreciate that we have an option to see you this way, but I must confess, I can't wait to see you standing up and pacing um, next time we come to Oman, because you actually, when you do feel mobile, it's another way of communicating to us with your body, what your strength or what your feeling is about this particular issue. But man, I'll take uh, Ahmed Mukani anywhere, including, um, is this your home couch you're speaking from? Yeah, this is the, what we call the front room. The British people call it the front room. Yes. It's where the, uh, the, the children are not allowed to come in, but uh, with COVID-19 and the uh, forced lockdown, they actually have to, uh, you know, they were allowed to come in. So, so this is the front room where they actually sit in and, you know, uh, this is not where my office is. My office is uh, inside the living room. So you were ready to... Okay. To hear whatever you want to uh, benefit us with. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and uh, for everybody, and for Nick and Sophia for organizing this. Um, what, uh, you know, just to joke on the yellow line, uh, uh, I also have similar kind of engagement with the Reformed Church in America, the, the old American mission in Oman, and they describe. Uh, what I do is as the pink line, uh, because you know we kind of approach the red, but we avoid being very red, and uh, that's always that's always very helpful. Uh, perhaps uh, I would like to, today to uh, just to give a brief on uh, how I feel and what has you know this last uh, kind of six months have been uh, in Oman. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to go maybe through three or four points. Uh, I'll try to be brief, uh, as brief as possible, so just to provide you with time so you can ask questions through, uh, and I believe uh, Sophia would actually uh, would, um, moderate that. Um, and uh, on the, at the outset of all of this, I would like to say that I'm quite positive uh, and also, the, I think the, the, the mood in the country is quite positive. 
Uh, and as I speak, uh, and uh, over the three points, you would realize why uh, people are being positive. Uh, I think also part of it is there was a very uh, large concern about what was going to happen when the Sultan Qaboos dies or died. And, uh, and people now are more comfortable that uh, they can understand where Sultan Haytham um, uh, is going or taking the country. But for me, um, most importantly, uh, finally, after years, you know, since 2014, uh, trying to indicate to the government the sense of urgency that they need to assume, um, no one, I mean, finally, finally now, Sultan Haytham has managed to accord this situation, the fiscal situation, the attention, the focus, and the urgency deserves. And uh, it was very evident is, uh, from day one, and also when he, when he actually had his first speech in February, uh, that he's going to actually give that his utmost priority. So uh, that for me is sufficient to indicate that we are in good hands. Because unfortunately, until the death of uh, Sultan Qaboos, um, things were, you know, business was as usual. You know, the government uh, was not really paying attention to how the uh, situation needs to be managed. No clear plans. Um, the sense of urgency also was really absent among all the ministers. The Council of Ministers had no directions. And that was uh, very uh, worrying. Uh, but now uh, I think we are um, in good shape. So the way I'm going to actually uh, uh, go about it, and please, Sophia, let me know if I'm, I'm waffling or somebody is uh, yawning or needs to actually do a stretch, let me know. I can actually cut short uh, the, the point and move on to something else or provide more space for discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, maybe address uh, how Sultan Haytham uh, is moving with the uh, uh, institutionalization of the state and uh, also uh, I'll talk about the fiscal balance and, and the things that are going on, the, the challenges that we are having and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, and uh, then I'll also talk about the, uh, the participatory process uh, that we think is going to be enhanced. Unfortunately, COVID-19 might actually dampen it a bit, but overall uh, it's clear that uh, Sultan Haytham is interested in widening uh, uh, the, the, the participatory process uh, in the development uh, and involving more and more people into making decisions that touch their lives. And finally, if time um, permits, I would like to touch upon uh, the cascading of the Oman 2040 into the five year plans uh, and the, you know, and the lack thereof or what they need to do because they also um, have been impacted by the death of the Sultan and they are also slow. Um, so to go first, I would like to talk about the, 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 institutional, the institutionalization of the state. Uh, on one hand, the death of the Sultan Qaboos was a good thing for Oman because as long as he lived, uh, institutions of the state could not evolve. They could not evolve independently. They could not actually be uh, themselves. People always resorted to Sultan Qaboos either to give guidance or to tell them what he expects them to do. So these institutions, whether it was the judiciary, the security, the police, the, uh, the parliament, the ministries, uh, uh, they were not, did not have that confidence on going about their own business. Nowadays it's different. Uh, the, the Sultan Haytham is really, has given them uh, this kind of uh, uh, independence, but also this kind of confidence. I'll give you an example. During the Sultan Qaboos time, uh, uh, archaeological sites, historical matters, were spread among uh, people that he knew or liked or people who could all have 
his Excellency Rawas was in charge of archaeology in the far, was in charge of archaeology in certain parts of the Dakhariya region. Then we had uh, the uh, Zubair in charge of some historical project. We had uh, Sultan Haytham at the time he was the Minister of Heritage, was in charge of some uh, elements of heritage and culture. And then we had Ministry of Tourism, who took also some elements of, 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 of heritage and culture. So the one portfolio was spread based on individuals, those individuals who managed to get to the Sultan Qabus. And the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, in a way, was devoured of its authority, its powers, even the law, the law of uh, preservation of national heritage uh, became almost a defunct law. Nobody could actually you know, uh, enforce it because how would you enforce it if you don't have authority on the things that are listed within the law? So when Sultan Haytham came to power, first thing he did was to restore all of that. So everything to do with the heritage and culture and archeology, span etc had to go back to the Ministry of Heritage and Culture. And then also he said that he is going to actually restructure the government uh, to make sure that sectorally, sectors are you know, kind of consolidated. So people can know exactly what is involved and can really work on them um, properly. Um, but of course, uh, as a, a country still uh, uh, based on tribalism, patriarchy and corporatism, uh, Sultan uh, is still, uh, his appointment, his choice of uh, confidence would be dependent on loyalty, you know, those who believe, he believes to be uh, loyal to him. Um, so we believe that uh, with the message that he has already given to us now, that we are going to actually have a better institution of the state. And uh, he has also identified that in his speech in February 2020, where he also said that he's going to slim the government apparatus, uh, streamline decision-making process, make uh, government agencies more accountable to, to people. How he's going to do that, we don't know, but at least that's uh, a commitment he made upon himself uh, to the people. And, and people felt very much um, uh, reassured. Uh, then one more thing about institutionalization before I, I move on to the other point, uh, points. Uh, usually succession uh, cases in the region have often been associated with either promises of improved uh, participatory process. So uh, we'll have, uh, for example, in Qatar, they had municipal councils. In the UAE, they widened the, uh, the, uh, the federal council and so forth or like the case in Saudi Arabia, they gave handouts. Well, in the case of Oman, Sultan Hassan does not have the money. He can't afford to give handouts. And the, um, the Majlis Ashura is already having powers that uh, are not being utilized. Uh, so what he actually offered uh, his people instead is social justice and clean state. So clean from corruption. And people uh, responded. So surprisingly, I mean, I was of the opinion that the moment they introduce, they, they lift subsidies from fuel, or they discuss about lifting subsidies from electricity and water, we would have marches on the street. People will actually just go and break things. Quite the contrary, people accepted that. Also now when His Majesty the Sultan uh, uh, ordered that anyone who served 30 years uh, or more in government, the civil service, uh, would have to be uh, retired. So forced retirement. Uh, there was some concern that people would actually uh, be go against it, but you know, people actually liked it. People went ahead with it. They realized that it, it, had, it was applied across the board. So this retirement was applied to undersecretaries, senior government officials, as well as you know John Smith on the you know, on the on the on the street, like myself, for example. People can just go and, and get retired. Um, I and mean, luckily, I don't have to, to retire because I'm on a contract basis. That's the beauty of being on contract. Um, uh, so people seem to prefer or to actually value uh, social justice or the, the the value of justice itself as demonstrated by the state and as the efforts uh, by the state 
it in terms of curbing corruption. Uh, and also the, uh, the people are valuing common good that will prevail even at the expense of potential loss for themselves. And, and that was an interesting thing to happen. Uh, it was completely contrary to expectations because people thought the moment you hit their pockets, they'll actually go on and, uh, you know, and as I said, they have um, marches uh, on the street. So what he did, he actually strengthened um, the fighting of corruption. So for example, now state-owned companies or state-owned enterprises have all been consolidated under the Oman Investment uh, Authority. Uh, we've been asked at the Capital Market Authority by law to establish uh, governance principles for state-owned uh, enterprises, which we did. Uh, it's not been issued yet. However, the, the direction from the Sultan was to start implementing it until now we are, you know, the, 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 these governance will be promulgated within a week or two. But then, for example, <coughs> in the governance, uh, no minister, no under subsecretary level, no assistant minister can be on the board of any state-owned company. And now this has been implemented uh, at once. So people were, they felt that, you know, there, these kind of state-owned companies were uh, 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 a, a scope for corruption. That was the first uh, station or the first uh, area the Sultan has um, um, uh, has actually uh, addressed. He also went into decentralization. Uh, he, for example, he ordered some of the budget allocation for development to be given to governors, to governors, sorry, and these governors of the 10 regions would actually have to have a mechanism by which they can allocate these resources. So, and by that also, he, he instructed that uh, uh, municipal councils to actually be revamped and maybe to be given more powers uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, decentralized decision making uh, in order to give people more power in how their daily lives um, are, are impacted. And then also, uh, again, social justice, uh, which was really a surprise uh, for me, uh, His Majesty promised that Oman will, uh, will actually ratify the, or actually Oman ratified Oman ratified its accession to the Convention of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, and that was a surprise uh, because that convention was actually one of the most con you know, controversial convention for uh, the government uh, in, during Sultan Qaboos time uh, to convince them to actually uh, go ahead and ratify it. Uh, and finally, uh, his focus on inclusion uh, in the sense uh, pardoning dissidents, you know, uh, we've had uh, one or two uh, supposed dissidents who were uh, in the UK have been pardoned and they made their way back uh, to Oman. Also, uh, as you might know, uh, before His Majesty's Qasan Qabush time, uh, we had a dual system in Oman. We had the imamic system, which is a theocracy system, uh, and we had the monarchy. And then when uh, the British uh, has helped uh, the, the monarchy in 1958, the theocracy system actually uh, 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 fled uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia. They are still there. So uh, His Majesty has now re-naturalized the, descend the, the descendants, the children of the last imam, the last uh, theocratic rulers. So now the leaders of the Oman diaspora in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been uh, naturalized or re-naturalized and brought back to Oman in order to make sure that he has an, an inclusive, um, uh, how do you say, uh, you know, a home front. Um, I've just realized I've been speaking. Shall I stop here and leave the other three or four points later and give more people time to ask because I don't want to take all the time talking. Maybe if you could just, um, uh, Ahmed, maybe if you could just give a brief summary of just say what the points are, and then if people want to ask clarifying questions, um, we can follow wherever the students want to go. Okay. Well, the, uh, the other uh, questions, the other points were going to be about um, the fiscal balance in terms of uh, fiscal balance or economic reform, uh, and then how COVID-19 is going to impact us, not in terms of limiting uh, our GDP, but more of impacting the importers of our oil. And then uh, the, to actually talk about um, 
uh, more about the uh, enhancing the participatory process, particularly the issue of uh, civil society and reinforcement of, uh, of their position. Um, uh, and finally, the challenge about um, cascading the Oman 2040 into the five year plans. That's it. Thank you. So now let's open up for questions. Um, if any part of that um, sounds interesting to people, anybody has any thoughts or clarifying questions, um, let's just kick off the conversation. I would love to personally hear about um, the impact of COVID in, on oil importers and then also about civil society. Um, I don't have any specific questions about it yet, but those two um, areas of discussion sound really interesting. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nick, is it possible to take uh, two or three questions and points and then maybe see how we can blend them together? Sure. Um, does somebody else have another point? Alexis? Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I'm so glad to hear that uh, the Sultan's new focus or he's really expressed interest in what you're calling social justice. I was wondering um, if he's paying any special attention to migrant workers in the country or what is possibly being done um, about their situation, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, good. Yeah, and I'll actually add in one final point to that as well, is saying what, ha what is the interaction between migrants returning to their home countries and the switch in the private sector um, and private sector reform in Oman? Um, I know, in, for example, in the Emirates, at least, a friend of the program, Sach, uh, he has faced a lot of trouble with his real estate business and a lot of uh, expats and uh, migrant, migrant workers that are living in the Gulf have gone home. Um, so just curious about how that side of the private sector is interacting with public sector reforms. Okay, great. Fine. Well, um, regarding the uh, COVID-19 impact, um, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the main importer of Oman's oil is China. Uh, China uh, takes about 80% uh, or 75% of our oil export goes to China. And if China, uh, the uh, output is reduced or the requirement of oil is reduced, we are doomed because we are really dependent on them. Uh, our, uh, you know, revenue, the government revenue is largely dependent on hydrocarbon. That's more oil and uh, gas. Uh, and that's where COVID-19 is impacting us. If we go to COVID-19 from an economic perspective, if you look at the GDP structure, for example, um, uh, we have uh, the non-hydrocarbon activities in the GDP are 64%, uh, but you know those which are associated with uh, restriction on movement, uh, like sales of goods and services and so forth, are only about 41% uh, of that, of the GDP. Uh, yet, again, going back to the revenue, these only make, uh, you know, uh, uh, taxes, associated taxes with the service fees and so forth, only make 11% of the total revenue. So now what the government needs to actually discuss or really work on uh, is the, 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 the issue of fiscal reform or fiscal balance and economic reforms. Um, because there is a disparity, you know, we are still really dependent on uh, hydrocarbon as a main revenue for the, uh, for the government. Unless the government decides not to fund such activities and really go to the private sector, either through privatization or through PPP or through debts, securities and so forth, uh, the government cannot continue to uh, run uh, its activities relying on, uh, on hydrocarbon. So that's one of the elements that where COVID-19 has been impacting, uh, uh, we think we will be impacting uh, the Omani economy and the Omani revenue. We don't have at this moment in time, we don't have data that can actually back this up uh, in terms of real data, post-effect, uh, post-factor kind of data. This is only based on historic data in terms of uh, uh, hydrocarbon impact or hydrocarbon share and so forth. Um, when it comes to civil society, um, 
uh, His Majesty the Sultan, sorry, let me talk about COVID-19, also about migrant workers and so forth. What happened in COVID-19, COVID the government uh, extended all medical care and, and kind of other investigations, tests or health care and, and, and treatment to all citizens in the country, whether migrants or Omanis. So there was no uh, distinction. Uh, where, for example, uh, the, the migrant workers uh, had uh, no, uh, their, their sponsors uh, or their employers were not willing to help, the government was also help them to actually send them back home. Uh, but where the employers were identified and were willing to help, uh, the employers took upon them uh, to actually either take part in the uh, health care of the migrant workers, uh, uh, or actually also send them home. Most of the migrant workers opted to go back home because of the loss of other work uh, uh, job opportunities or because of the economic uh, slowdown and also because of the concern uh, because we had, for example, a lot of the Indian uh, community that uh, really had suffered terribly in terms of access to food, you know, they were they lived mainly in lockdown area, which was very strictly locked down. They had no movement. They couldn't do much of shopping, and they, they had to be given parcels. The government gave them parcels. Other people also gave them parcels, and so forth. But in terms of attention given to their rights, which also came as a surprise to a lot of observers, Oman now has lifted the NOC, which is the No Objection Certificate. Uh, for uh, migrant workers. So in the past, if a, a migrant worker came to Oman through a sponsor, before this migrant worker moves to another sponsor, he had to take a no certificate from the previous sponsor. This requirement is now null by law. Halas, they don't need to do so. As long as they have served their contract, they can move on. Stage, um, uh, is envisaged that uh, they would actually um, uh, may actually eliminate the whole uh, kafala uh, system uh, completely. Uh, that's something which uh, I hope it will happen uh, quite soon. Uh, Ahmed, um, I, Ahmed, I'm sorry to interrupt, but could you right. just explain really quickly what the kafala system is? I don't think all of our students are probably familiar with what that is. Okay, a kafala system is uh, a legal uh, guardian sponsorship system where any migrant worker before they come to Oman, they need to have a sponsor, uh, either a company or a person who would act as their guardian in front of the Omani government. And this uh, usually it's, a, it's the employer who would actually take care of all of their medical expenses, uh, security checks uh, and so forth. So they'll be their guardian in Oman. Uh, that's with the Kafala system. For a lot of the uh, organizations like Human Rights Watch, you know, the ILO, they think, uh, you know, Kafala system is a form of modern day slavery uh, because, you know, the, the sponsor may dictate a lot upon the migrant worker and restrict their uh, freedom of movement or choice of, uh, of jobs. Uh, that's where the focus has been. Okay. Now, Coming to uh, civil, uh, sorry, migrant workers before we go to civil society, you know, the departure of a lot of migrant workers uh, outside Oman has also impacted the real estate in Oman. It's a similar situation like the Gulf, but because migrant workers in Oman are less percentage wise than other uh, countries like Bahrain, like Saudi Arabia, so like the UAE and so forth, uh, the, the impact has not been extremely negative, but we see now from the, uh, from the statistics and from the real estate market is really going down. So for example, rents, uh, uh, plot uh, uh, prices are really very cheap. So this is the real time. If you want to invest in a land or real estate in Oman, this is the time. Come and buy. You know, it's very, very, uh, very affordable. And my wife and I keep actually trying to find where we hit all the uh, our savings to see if we can make use of it. Uh, but my my wife prefers gold than, than real estate. Um, so civil society, uh, His Majesty the Sultan uh, made it very clear in 
in his first speech that the development in Oman. So it will not be just the government and the private sector. Civil society would actually provide advice, would provide um, uh, support, would provide you know, services, uh, uh, and uh, they might be closer to people um, uh, than, uh, than uh, the, the government apparatus. He might be, we don't know yet, he might be alluding to the Oman 2040, because in the Oman 2040, uh, the new role for the, for the civil society is to go into, for example, professional organizations that can actually license. So nowadays, uh, lawyers are licensed by the Ministry of Justice. The proposed change in the Oman 2040 that a lawyer's bar would actually do the licensing. So you no longer have to go to a government agency all licensing, all qualifications, certification will be done by uh, civil society, by non-profit making organizations. I think I've answered all of those. Thank you so much. And now if anyone else has other thoughts or the kind of points building off that, um, feel free to propose anything. I can add something to the mix. Um, so I guess one of the things that is really unique about Oman that we've all seen firsthand and the students per, are always impressed with in Oman is the history of mediation and the history of being, mm -hmm. for lack of a better kind of comparison of Switzerland in the modern Middle East, whether it's building, like maintaining ties between both Tehran and Baghdad during 1980 to 88, or the US and Iran in the most recent JCPOA and the Iran deal. So I guess, but a lot of that, um, for a lot of, at least external publications that have looked at Omani politics have said that that was partly because of Sultan Qaboos's unique longevity, um, that he was the longest serving Sultan in the region and had very personal ties with a lot of the leaders and elites in other countries that allowed him to really play this mediation game. So I guess um, in, from a foreign policy perspective and international relations perspective, how has Haitham bin Qadip able to step into the shoes of Sultan Qaboos um, following such a long reign? Um, and how has that affected kind of international relations of Oman. Yeah, uh, there are two elements to that. One element is the institution, which is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, and also how Oman has endorsed uh, or adopted uh, the policy of, um, you know, uh, non-interference on uh, respecting uh, others and this mutual respect and so forth. And also the persona of the Sultan. Uh, Sultan Qaboos' uh, personality is different from Sultan Haitham's personality. Qaboos is, uh, he was a person that um, is very oft forgiving, you know, it, it, he was very kind of an embracing person. Uh, he was known to be kind of, um, how do you say, very moody, so he can shoot through the roof very quickly, but soon he will calm down. Uh, but uh, all the people who worked with him, uh, have uh, spoke about him being very uh, forgiving, very, um, how do you say, not it's more, um, more, um, more absorbing, more kind of uh, adaptive to things and for, um, uh, for negotiation and discussion. And he managed to actually uh, uh, instill that in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also in his own uh, system of mediation, you know, those who have been observing Oman realize that Oman did not always use official diplomatic channels for mediation and to get things done. They will always do it behind that. We always do it through informal meetings, informal relationships. And this is still maintained as far as I have, uh, I'm aware or I have been told. Uh, but the persona uh, of the Sultan, that would be a challenge. Uh, in the sense, Haitham now is uh, about 60, 60 odd years. So he's calm down. He's not the usual, the old, young, very zealous person. He wants to make change. But he is also, um, his focus does not seem to be on external affairs. His focus seems to be more on the internal affairs. While Sultan Qaboos uh, managed to actually keep both uh, alive, and uh, as a, you know, uh, as a, also a, a Renaissance man, Sultan Qaboos had a lot of interest in maintaining the foreign uh, policy. Uh, but despite all of that, uh, it was very important for Sultan Haitham to mention in his speech when he assumed the throne 
And also when he gave the speech in February 2020, that they will maintain, that His Majesty's government will maintain the same uh, 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 approach and policy adopted by uh, Sultan Haitham. We don't know yet. So far, we have not been challenged. Maybe with the fiscal situation, there are people who are suggesting that Oman should go to Kuwait and Qatar and ask for help. Now, with the Emir of Qatar ailing, uh, would Qatar, would, sorry, with the Emir of Kuwait ailing, would the death of the Emir of Kuwait make them tip the balance and go to more of the UAE Saudi access? We don't know. Uh, we'll have to see that. Interesting. Hi. Could I ask a question? Um, firstly, thank you so much for speaking to us. I wanted to go back to when you were referencing civil society. So I'm assuming in Oman it's a different system than in the United States where civil society can sort of organize as a self-justified civil society organization. So in Oman, how does a civil society establish itself in the favor of the government? And in what ways do they legitimize themselves, especially in regards to migrant workers? Well, you are right. Civil society in Oman, actually in the Gulf, is quite uh, different from uh, what one would understand to be in uh, the United States, uh, actually in Europe uh, at large. Uh, the, uh, the civil society groups here, they are, uh, the term actually, al-mujtama al-madani, civil society, is people don't feel very comfortable talking about. Uh, it was only in 2011, after the Arab Spring, when His Majesty Sultan Qaboos used it, people felt comfortable using it. And now with Sultan Haytham using it, people are feel more comfortable using it. But most people use terms that are used in the Gulf as well as in Jordan, like al-mujtama al-ahli or jamiat al-ahliya, referring to more of the popular uh, groups. And uh, they basically, a lot of them, I would say 99.9% .9 are charity oriented or country clubs, right? So when I say country clubs, you would have the uh, medical association, you'd have the lawyers association, you'd have the social workers association, but they do not, um, they are not involved in any policy making. They are not involved in any licensing or certification. Uh, they're basically a, a platform where people of common interest can come together, maybe conduct some training programs, maybe have some conferences, maybe there is an issue, uh, you know, engage, you know, public awareness and so forth, but it is not a, a platform for them where they can make policy changes. Uh, and we have categories of them. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the categories shortly, but usually for a civil society group to exist, uh, you would have to submit an application to the Ministry of Social Development. You would have to have 40 founders. It goes through a lot of security checks before they allow um, an, an, an organization like this actually to exist. And we have uh, women groups and usually funded and held by the government. We have uh, charity groups and we have uh, teams that are made by young people, uh, formed by young people who are actually then, they have to assign to, to attach themselves to a charity group. We have also uh, some professional organizations like the lawyers and etc. I mentioned to you, uh, and we have also the um, um, foundations for large families and wealthy families. They have their own foundations for grants and gifts and so forth. And then we also have the uh, foreign uh, communities, uh, kind of uh, um, diplomatic community. Can actually have. So, for example, we have the Indian community, we have the Sudanese community, we have the Egyptian community. Each one of them have their own organization licensed by the government to, uh, to operate uh, within Oman. Uh, they are not, uh, as we say, the, the 501c kind of groups, where they are non-profit making organization, where they just, uh, they have a, a, an interest, and they actually want to make sure that they affect policy change, they lobby, no, they don't. The, the Omani Society for Righteous and Literati, uh, for some time, tried to exercise this and it was, they were kind of, they were really made quiet, right? Uh, uh, they were in a way kind of prosecuted um, and now they try to express some opinion, but largely, largely in favor of the government and they will not address any policy uh, issues uh, uh, at all. 
what we have seen in 2013, the introduction of um, endowment establishments. And before 2013, endowments were largely religious organization. But then they now, in 2013, they introduced a new uh, form of endowment, which is also like a foundation, but a different name. And this time it's under the Ministry of Religious Affairs and uh, Endowment, where uh, you can actually uh, establish uh, an organization to look after a particular group of people or your own interest uh, and so forth. But again, none of them is about awareness, none of them is about advocacy or policy change. So in that sense, they are not serving as a civil society in the same manner we understand them in, the, in Europe or in, uh, in the state. And that's where 2040 is trying to make a change that they should actually be more like think tanks. We don't have think tanks in that sense, right? So we have to have more think tanks, more people who can assist the government in affecting change. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, I remember when we met in Oman, you were talking about the increasing political consciousness within women and the youth. And right now you're mm -hmm. mentioning how um, there's gonna be more room for political participation. So I'm wondering how those two are interconnecting with the new Sultan and if he has any visions um, and if you can speak on like women and youth specifically. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, um, we found that uh, in municipal councils, uh, municipal elections, uh, women were more trusted than men in terms of uh, you know, getting elected and more votes. I think uh, people feel that municipal uh, councils are less political, so they are a natural extension of a woman's role uh, in looking after society and family and so forth. Um, the uh, unfortunately also this year we had we were supposed to have elections uh, the municipal elections in October but they have been postponed because of COVID-19 uh, that would have been an opportunity to actually see how this will translate but the Sultan did mention very specifically uh, that he hopes to have more or better role uh, for uh, women uh, in, in the next phase how would that actually how would that actually materialize um, I don't know yet but uh, People who are closer to the Sultan, uh, they think that we'll have more representation of women in the cabinet. Um, I've been working also with the first Omani uh, group, Omani women group called the Jamaat uh, al in Muscat. And what we are working now towards is to transform this uh, Omani uh, women association from um, uh, just a charity group to a think tank to take policy change for um, for women, you know, particularly to focus on women. The issue of quota has been raised again. I don't know how far it will go through uh, with His uh, Majesty. Uh, so uh, we'll we'll see. I mean, um, so far we have received a lot of assurances, statements, public statements, but nothing has materialized on the ground. We're waiting to see when uh, the new cabinet is uh, structured, uh, how, how many women would actually be there, and also if the quota system is going to be uh, endorsed. When it comes to youth, it's a different story. Um, first of all, now um, a lot of the, uh, the state-owned companies uh, that have been revamped have now uh, young Omanis of different ages, but young Omanis uh, as members of the board. So more uh, of younger Omanis to actually make decisions in these boards. The Omani, the National Youth uh, Commission uh, is much closer to the decision-making circle of Sultan Haitham. Um, again, a lot of statements, a lot of uh, promises from him. Uh, until we see something in the uh, next uh, cabinet, we hope that the cabinet would actually be more and more younger people. Uh, so unless we have to wait until that cabinet reshuffle takes place in order to make any objective judgment. I don't, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, sorry, can I just have um, one more follow up? Um, for back of letter, better words, I know with Sultan Qaboos there was like immense trust from the people in his governance. Mm -hmm. And now with the new Sultan, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's still like, well, I don't know if it's like quite gonna be at the extent that it was with Sultan. Are, are people 
being more engaged with like paying attention? Is political consciousness increasing in your opinion? Are people being more attentive? Like what does that look like? Um, well, it is difficult to compare Sultan Haytham or Sultan Qaboos because people literally worship Sultan Qaboos. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, and you know, uh, Sultan Haytham, uh, you know, the 23rd of July, Sultan Qaboos took over, took uh, had a coup, and took over from his father, and that uh, day was every year celebrated as the Renaissance Day. When Sultan Haytham took office, that day was removed from the national holiday list. Okay. Uh, yet, people still celebrate it in their own way, okay? Because they think that was the real day of birth, of the Omani rebirth, the Omani uh, current state uh, or modern state. Um, but uh, in some of my earlier comments I had, I hope uh, you didn't miss them, that you know, what Sultan Haytham has offered the people is social justice. And so they are actually uh, they value that and they have trust in him, but he is tested. He's being tested now how far he can go with social justice as he has promised. And uh, we would know this by the end of the year because as you are aware, uh, uh, we have, the, His Majesty is now restructuring the government. And what we have proposed to him, when I say we, the policy advisors, that in addition to restructuring the government, we need to let go of 40% of civil servants, right? And we thought he would not accept that. Sultan Qaboos definitely did not accept it, right? Sultan Hassan took it on board because he said, we need to explain to people we cannot afford to run the country uh, where 75% of our budget is wages, right? Um, so and when he explained that, or through his people, people accepted that we are going to lose jobs or some of them are going to lose jobs, but for the better collective uh, good. So by the end of the year, we would know how much of that has resulted in a positive impact, but also we would know about uh, the uh, corruption fighting mechanism that he has instituted, as well as the new cabinet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have about seven minutes left. Um, so let's invite anyone to pop in with last burning questions. Sure, I have a question. Um, I remember when uh, I was in Oman in 2016, there was a lot of discussion about ways that Oman could diversify its economy in preparation for mm -hmm. the day when uh, oil could, would no longer fill that role. Uh, what's new on that front? What kind of initiatives is the new Sultan taking uh, to deal with that? Yeah, thank you very much question uh, position remains as it is so um, a lot of wishful thinking uh, uh, in, in, in we insisted that this can only be achieved if they appoint a prime minister or they appoint somebody with a specific mandate to actually uh, diversify the economy uh, at this moment in time, I'm not seeing any real efforts to diversify the economy. It still remains wishful thinking. The, you know, one example, every minister, first thing in the morning they look at is the oil price. Right? They did not manage to get off that habit yet. Um, they, uh, one of the things also asked for is more incentive packages for industries and to choose an industrial sector to be a locomotive for the country, nothing has been done. They are still waiting for, you know, uh, Harry Potter magic wand to come and give them that magic bullet. But we told them there's no magic, you know, silver bullet. You have to do something, you have to sacrifice, and you know, but hopefully they will listen eventually. Hopefully Sultan Haitham would appoint somebody to that position, give him that mandate. Thank you. So also, so I had one of the things that we have been, thank you so much for your time and just wonderful insights. I know at least for myself and I'm sure for many other, everyone else here, um, we all really appreciate you being with us today. One of the things that is very important about the Ibrahim program is that it's also not just a one way road. Uh, we don't want to only understand Oman, we also want to understand Omani perspectives on us and on the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States right now is in, frankly, turmoil <laughs> between coronavirus and election year, economic recession, racial injustice um, and persistent protests and everything else that is happening in the news like that you are and all of us are aware of. So I guess then as we're moving towards an election year, 
how is Oman looking at the United States today? How is the conversation, you use the word social justice in the conversation of, about um, social changes in Oman. Um, and so I guess just if you could quickly just discuss a little bit about Omani perspectives on the United States today um, and how um, we as American citizens should be thinking about Oman um, as we go to the ballot, um, go to uh, the voting booths uh, this upcoming November. Well, thank you very much Nick, for the question. Well, usually um, elections are won on national agenda, not on external agenda. So uh, elections will be voted according to you know what matters most to American people. I mean, Oman will only make about you know zero one percent of something of the agenda uh, of other parties. Uh, we don't hope for that, you know, but we just we hope that um, uh, situation in the Middle East uh, is not uh, forgotten completely. Um, and you know, some you know, this, the deal of the century <laughs> needs to be revised uh, more than anything else. But um, going back to your question, the feeling I'm getting from the policymakers in Oman is wait and see. They are just waiting and see. We're not we're not having any expectations. We don't know whether Trump would actually uh, re re be re-elected. Uh, I certainly think he will be re-elected. Right. Um, but uh, the Omani government is still just wait and see. Um, I know that um, the financial in investors in states and in Europe are interested in Omani debt. So uh, despite the lower credit rating that we have, uh, we have been approached by a lot of these uh, agencies and investors to see whether Oman is interested in going back to the market and issue uh, bonds or so called. Uh, so we are, you know, hopeful that uh, we will be able to get good uh, uh, interests in that. Nick? Yeah. I want to ask a, a last question on the run. Uh, besides letting you know that we're looking forward for the very first safe moment mm -hmm. where we can fly and visit with you and begin Shall to I. face with you about the state of the world. Um, and last commentator we had was from Israel, a security expert named Yossi Alfer. We wanted to talk about a whole bunch of things and all he wanted to talk about was to let us know that Israel is preoccupied by one single thing and that is COVID-19 and the mismanagement of it and through the roof numbers of cases and deaths rising and the streets are filled with black flag de demonstrations, black flag demonstrations. I, it'd be interesting to hear in a, a moment what you think the management of COVID-19 has been with in Oman and why it doesn't actually reach into the premier issue like it did in Israel. And, and it still is in the United States as well. The fundamental driving force, as you said, whether Trump wins and right now Trump is a thug who's lost to the virus. Um, and he's in desperate shape, you should know. Okay. Mm, I know, I know that. But, you know, uh, I never trust, uh, uh, you know, uh, opinion polls, never. My experience told me never to trust them. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, Oman and COVID-19, I mean, I think our uh, management of COVID-19 was extremely good. We managed to control the growth and the pattern of uh, infection uh, until Oman uh, became under a lot of uh, economic pressure as well as uh, uh, neighboring uh, countries pressure and the WHO and the World Bank and they allowed the, uh, the ease the lockdown. We all thought that the easing came prematurely. And then with the easing of the lockdown and people were not ready for it, uh, we have now uh, the, uh, you know, the infection rate uh, and the pattern really went through the roof. And that's why as of yesterday, uh, they've started another uh, more in comprehensive lockdown and a curfew with the objective that actually this will, um, you know, will, will, be, will manage uh, the present, the, the, this kind of um, rate of infection. But it is, um, uh, it has been a major issue for the Sultan. The Sultan has appointed a Supreme Committee that he actually uh, follows through very quickly. And it was, uh, uh, it is headed by the person who has direct access uh, uh, to him. So, you know, he's there uh, uh, and on every single moment. 
the main challenge or with the situation in Israel, uh, you know that Israel internal political landscape is a very, very complex. And, uh, you know, it is not the issue of security. They would actually say, okay, let's now reunite. So somebody within Israel would say, let's use COVID-19 to reunite, to restructure our alignments, our political alignment and allegiances and so forth. Uh, so it, it could be a kind of a more of an utilization, a utility for politicians more than reality. Thank you. Fantastic. And thank you so much, Ahmed. So just, I know we all really appreciate seeing you and especially so many of the people from the most recent cohort um, have really fresh thank memories you. of you. So thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, I would also well, mention- thank you. I do apologize for taking so long at the beginning, so I apologize. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I think that all of us today, uh, it's lovely just to learn from your wisdom and to just really sit with you. So thank you so much. Um, and I will also say, Ahmed, is it okay if anybody wants your contact information that we can share it with Please. people? Okay. So I will also say Ahmed, Ahmed is an absolutely incredible resource for anyone that is interested in doing stuff in Oman, either through further research or graduate study, undergraduate study. So if you're interested in those kinds of things, like definitely shoot him a message and he's a great resource for everyone.